Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Lobo Tigre from the independent speculator.com. You can find him on Twitter at Due Diligence Guy. He's speaking to us from Puerto Rico. Welcome back to the show, Lobo. Glad to be on with you, Jim. The trade wars, the trade winds, uh, how are they blowing right now? Uh, are there big concerns on the market about maybe new tariffs or bigger tariffs coming up on the weekend? <laughs> Well, the tariffs are still scheduled to go in place, and the Trump team has said those are still on the table, but there's also been whisperings or rumors that, well, we're making good progress again. So I think the market doesn't know which way to go. I'd like to believe that they're finally starting to come to this sense and not overreact every time there's a tweet one way or the other on this thing. I guess I'm not that optimistic. You know, when, whenever something that seems to be a clear indication comes to pass, I, I think we'll see a big market reaction. And if those tariffs do go in, um, I think there will be a significant market impact. And and uh, I would not I would not write that off. Uh, yes, I do think uh, a deal wants to happen, um, but I think the apparent strength of the U.S. economy um, emboldens the U.S. side to you know step up its brinksmanship. So I think the markets are sort of expecting there will be a last-minute postponement. Maybe there will be, but I would not bet on that. If there isn't a postponement, do we know how severe the impact of the tariffs would be? Well, it is it is a marginal increase, but it's, I mean, 15% is too marginal if you're having to pay it, if that's your particular business. But I'm just talking about the overall trade war. Uh, 15% on whatever 100 billion. It's it's part of a bigger package. You know that said, this part covers consumer uh, products for the, and that's something that you know people may notice more this time around. It may impact prices they see, and it could also impact significant um, companies in the marketplace. Uh, I understand that Apple is one in particular that could really get hit in the, in the tap that might come for this particular tip here. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's tempting to say, oh, it's just all part of the process, you know, the art of the deal. Uh, but this could indeed rock the boat. Uh, also, with it happening just before Christmas, I don't know how many people take advantage of pre-Christmas sales, but perhaps, especially men, are last-minute shoppers. That could be an impact. <laughs> Yeah, though I think that it tends to, uh, I'm, I don't know this for a fact, but as I recall hearing about this before, the goods that are already on the boats on their way or, or that are in the trucks on their way from the ports to the stores, they're not going to be impacted. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that the tariff increase, if it happens now, would really impact shopping this year. But it would obviously be yet another push of, of uncertainty and destabilization, which would be very good for you know our friends uh, in the gold and silver space. And uh, I also heard too that uh, even when the tariffs were first whispered about, people uh, imported as much as they could from China and filled warehouses up so they wouldn't have to pay tariffs in the future. Was that a factor in perhaps a, a downturn in manufacturing this year? Yeah, I can definitely see that, and I can see that happening again. Um, We'll see. Now, on gold and silver, you said uh, there's an impact there. Well, this is uh, actually a larger issue than just the trade thing, of course, but I think this feeds into something that I've been thinking about uh, lately, and that is the asymmetrical risk I see in the precious metal space. The market over the last few months, last quarter, uh, since August, since the September peak, 
and people are very unhappy. They wanted gold to keep going. And, of course, everybody always wants price to keep going up. But after such a rapid rise, it's, of course, no surprise at all to see a period of correction and consolidation. That's perfectly normal. Uh, gold had a great year in 2019. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. I don't think we, as gold bugs, have anything to complain about. Uh, that said, I actually do see something quite positive in the trading action. We've, we've had a correction. We've had this period of consolidation. But gold has shown a lot of support. It's, it's repeatedly tested uh, a much higher set of lows than um, previously. You know, we, we have not gone back to that 1300 range that gold was stuck in for all those years. I, I think that's quite significant. It shows a lasting shift in the marketplace. More anecdotally, it's, it's interesting to me to hear mainstream financial guys talking about the news, the headlines, prices of the three major indices in the U.S. and gold, and occasionally even throwing silver in there, which never happened five years ago. It's, it's, it's again, evidence of this change. Uh, and on the fundamentals, I'm not really a technical analyst. You know, it's easy to, to talk about support because everybody understands what I mean. But on the on the fundamental level, I think you look at what's going on, and here's this trade war, which is not resolved. And even if there's this phase one deal, which I'm skeptical of, but even if that happens, it's not the end of the problem. And you have the cooling global economy, you have uh, geopolitical tensions. There's all kinds of reasons for uh, safe haven assets to continue to be of interest to investors around the world. And then on top of that, you have the anecdotal evidence I was talking about. You have the technical support that we've seen. So I'm not seeing a lot of downside risk in the precious metal space right now. Whereas if something does blow up, like a setback in the trade war or more physically in the geopolitical scene, there's a whole lot of upside. I like that a lot. You know, when, when I have limited downside, but potentially a great deal of upside, that's very attractive to me. And of course, you know, as your listeners know, the stocks add leverage to the underlying commodities. So um, you know, we could have a terrific 2020. I'm expecting that, actually. This is the time of year for forward-looking statements. And my outlook right now is very bullish for 2020 for the precious metals investors. We'll have more with Lobo Tigre when we return. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Lobo Tigre. Lobo, what's happening with uranium? Well, some very interesting news in that space. Not directly uranium. Well, some is, some isn't. There's rumors that are directly, and there's news that isn't. The news is that the um, military in the U.S. has announced that they're building a rare earths plant and to secure domestic supply of these vital metals that go into lots of high-tech applications, including military applications. What does that got to do with uranium? Well, it shows that this administration in its direction in the military, it does care about securing U.S. supplies of critical uh, metals and other resources. So if this administration is willing to do that for rare earths, why on earth would they not do it for uranium, of which the U.S. imports more than 90-odd percent? 93 percent was the number in the, in the DOC report. So that's that's very bullish for those that are looking forward to support uh, of U.S. uranium producers, or at least an end to this question about whether the U.S. will support U.S. US uranium producers, which brings us to the other bit of non-news but rumor, and that is uh, that uh, Reuters report, was it Bloomberg, one of the business news uh, networks reported a leak from members of the nuclear fuel working group that Trump established in July to look into this issue. 
And the word is that that group has, uh, like the Department of Commerce before it, recommended that Trump support U.S. uranium production, um, though their idea isn't tariffs or quotas or something, but to order the military and U.S. agencies to buy more domestically. Um, now, that's obviously good news for the U.S. uranium producers and, and people with projects in the U.S., and we saw uh, when this news leaked about a week ago, uh, we saw immediate impact. Was it a week ago? <laughs> Some days ago. We saw an immediate impact. Uh, some of the obvious beneficiaries were up double digits that day and rose the next day or two after the news leaked. So there's, a, there's an obvious play there as this becomes reality. What are the, you know, could I be wrong or could Trump ignore his working group that he established? I suppose that's possible. But I, re- I really don't think that's likely. If, if he was going to uh, not take action, there's no particular reason for him to establish the, the working group. He could have just said last July when he had a chance, nah, we'll let the market handle this. So I'm not worried about importing uranium from our good friends in Canada or down under, which is where the U.S. gets most of its uranium. Uh, you know, if that was what he was inclined to do, he should have, he, he, I think he would have done it last July. And supporting U.S. producers very much fits with his uh, America first uh, rhetoric, if nothing else. So, to me, all the signs point for him supporting uh, U.S. uranium producers. There are the obvious beneficiaries that we just spoke of. I don't want to name names, but it's pretty easy to figure that out. Uh, but even if, uh, you know, that doesn't happen or if that's limited in impact, just the end of this whole process, I think, is important. The U.S. is still one of the biggest uh, nuclear power-generating countries in the world, a fleet of 100 reactors or so, one of the biggest buyers of uranium. And the buyers, you know, they have to be wondering what the rules are going to be for them and hesitant to enter into new contracts until they know what those are. So just the resolution of this issue, I think, is very bullish for uranium in 2020. We'll have more with Lobo Tigre right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the 2019 drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Lobo Tigre. Lobo, what's life look like for our junior miners going into the new year? Well, there's been this... um perception in the industry that there's a kind of trickle-down theory and that when sentiment is bullish on metals and mining or, or limited even to the gold and silver space, that investors first rush into the majors and then it trickles down to the mid-tiers and then to the juniors. Um, and I think, I'm not going to say that's wrong. I, I think we, we certainly do see some of that and, and I have definitely seen in the past that the name brands that people recognize, your your Barracks and Newmonts of the world, it used to be more, now it's pretty much those two, uh, you know, they, they are obvious beneficiaries when broader markets get excited about gold and silver, and, and similarly um, down the line for other metals. Um, but it's not true that that has to happen first or that there's a trickle down eventually reaching the juniors, at least for the better juniors. I have also seen uh, very clearly in past rallies that the better juniors, the ones that everybody knows have projects of genuine merit, good management, making good progress, and hey, they're on sale because they've been beaten up. When the market turns around, uh, money seems to come back to those guys pretty quickly too, uh, if not at the same time as on the majors. So we were just talking before the commercial break about correction and consolidation in the gold and silver space being normal. And that tends to be bellwethers for the for the resource sector as a whole. Um, so now we need to differentiate, though, because I, I am very bullish on gold and silver going into 2020. I'm very silver, uh, sorry, bullish on uranium going into 2020. 
The industrial metals, though, not so much. I really am very hesitant to get into copper, even though I see structural supply issues there, or nickel, which is another one of my favorite industrial metals going forward. Even those, I'm hesitant to get into right now because of all these signs of the global economy cooling. Um, The the news from Europe just recently is even more uh, ominous on that front. And let us not forget that as, as bullish as seems in the U.S., at least on Wall Street, there are still concerns on Main Street and, and plenty of recessionary signals out there. Just as I have to say, despite the employment numbers, too, other numbers don't look so well. Uh, and I don't want to get into the whole John Williams shadow stat thing, but I, I think there's good reason to question those employment numbers. So, long story short, very bullish on precious metals and uranium for 2020, industrial metals. I think I want to see the turnaround in the global economy first, and I think there will be plenty of time to buy bargains at that time. I don't see any reason to rush in right now and buy a great zinc play just because it's on sale. Yes, zinc will be necessary in the future, but that won't stop that stock from going down over the next year if we see more hurt on the global economic stage over 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else you see happening in 2020? Well, <laughs> That's a leading question. If any, you know, there's the election, of course. I've never been good at predicting elections. Uh, I don't know. I, I think a few months ago, I would have said I, I was pretty skeptical Trump would win. But with those woozy employment numbers, and if the easy money policy of the Fed keeps Wall Street boosted, um, we could, you know, could look pretty good for Trump. If, if the economy sours, though, I, I think he has a hard time winning. And if it's okay, it's not too bad. And if the Democrats pick a more radical candidate, I think that makes it easier for Trump. I think uh, Biden or Bloomberg are more likely to have a real shot at Trump. And I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but obviously that has potentially a very significant impact for investors. If Trump loses, it's, it's important. If one of the more radical ones, a Warren, were to win, that has big, big uh, implications. Uh, you know, we wouldn't see those until the end of the year or into 2021, but that's certainly something for investors to keep an eye on as those trends develop over the year. Lobo, thank you so much for chatting with us. Happy to do it, as always, Jim. My guest has been Lobo Tigre from the IndependentSpeculator.com. Find him on Twitter at Due Diligence Guy. He was speaking to us from Puerto Rico. If you have any questions for Lobo or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. You can find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook at Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.